we've talked about for several weeks now, this is us. What are the things that make us us? What are the things that set us apart from uh, the rest of the world? Sometimes for other people who uh, would be a part of a church somewhere in uh, the country, in the community even. This is us. And here's the this is us part of today. We're an Easter people. I want to share with you a few passages of Scripture. The first one from the Revelation where John recording... Right, he just jumps into the deep end of the pool uh, right away. There's no, there's no slow build up to the revelation. He, he, he takes off like a rocket. Grace and peace from the one who is and who always was and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness to these things. The first to rise from the dead and the commander of all the rulers of the world. All praise to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us his kingdom and his priests who serve before God his Father. Give him everlasting glory. He rules forever and ever. Amen. The angel at the garden tomb explaining the first Easter morning. He is not here. He has risen. Paul the apostle wrote to the Corinthians in, in the chapter, chapter 15, which is all about the risen Christ. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. You're still under condemnation for your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ have perished. And if we have hope in Christ only for this life, we are the most miserable people in the world. But the fact is Christ has been raised from the dead, and he has become the first of a great harvest of those who will be raised to life again. The good news of Jesus dying on our cross from the sin, for our sins, raised from the dead, victorious over sin, over death, over hell, is that we have hope. And we have hope for whatever we run into in this life, and we're going to have hope for whatever we face in eternity. Hope not... Not in us, but in him. And for those gathered today. We said this in the first hour. It's true in this hour too. Some of you walked in. I don't, I don't know everybody's story. But I know that for a lot of folks. They say hope is in short supply in my house just now. In my life. Hope. Is, I'm, I'm in a struggle for hope. Um, I, I see glimmers and glimpses of hope. And yet I, I find myself coming up way short. In the category of hope. Some for hope in this life, and truthfully, some, you need hope for eternity. You need hope that reaches beyond this life. Hope, hope of heaven one day that is not, I hope it works out, but hope that is assurance and, and a conviction, a, uh, a reality of heaven. What does, and, and I, I didn't say this in a children's sermon, I'll say this to you. I said it last Sunday. I'm going to close this eye periodically because this thing does float up and down on me too. So uh, if I close my eye, it's not just because I'm a bad winker. It's because, because. What does hope do? Why do we need hope? One, one writer, he wrote about hope this way. He said, hope is the fuel that the human heart runs on. A car crash, a diving accident can paralyze a body, but the loss of hope paralyzes a life, a spirit. Hope is what prompts a young man and woman to stand before witnesses and promise I do, even though they have no assurances, no guarantees. Hope is what fuels that same young couple. Years later, after broken promises, broken hearts, to give their promise another try. Hope is why human beings keep bringing children into this broken, fallen world. Hope is why there are hospitals and universities. Hope is why there are Consultants and therapists. Hope is why the rangers keep going to spring training. <laughs> Pablo Casals continued to practice the cello, I read. Continued to practice the cello five hours a day, even though he was recognized as the greatest cellist in the world. Five hours a day. And as his age became advanced, he continued to practice five hours a day. And someone asked him... Why, when, when it's, it was painful for him, when it would just wore him out to practice five hours a day, they said, why do you keep doing this? And he, 
He said, I think I'm getting better. I think I'm getting better. That's hope. Michelangelo was laboring day after day, painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And the story is that he grew discouraged and just decided he was going to quit. He'd he'd done all he could do. He was weary, frustrated, alone. And as the dusk began to darken the Sistine Chapel, and it's already a shadowy place, and his body ached as he uh, laid on his back to paint that ceiling, and he was so, so desperate, doubtful, sore, The story is he climbed down the ladder from the scaffolding and he walked to eat a lonely supper all by himself and he wrote a sonnet on that occasion to himself, to his uh, aching body. And the last line of the sonnet is, I am no painter. And he went to bed. And the next morning at sunrise, He got up and he dressed and he climbed the scaffolding and he took his position on his back at the top of that scaffolding and he again resumed painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. That that amazing uh, vision of the the creator God and uh, what pushed him back up the ladder? Hope. We can survive the loss of an incredible number of things But no one can survive the loss of hope. When hope is gone, we are done. The capacity to stay focused on the presence and the power of God in our lives is so very important. And when we become more focused on the overwhelming storms around us, in us, when when that takes over and we stop being able to see beyond, to see God at work in his power, we're just going to be in trouble and Truth be told, some of you came in today and you say, I'm, I'm kind of in trouble on the, on the hope into things. The Bible sometimes, uh, often in fact, talks about heart, your heart, the real you in there. And, and sometimes it talks about losing heart. That's what discouragement is. When, when you, you lose that heart part of you, misplace it. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Paul writing about the challenges of his own life. And, and they were overwhelming. He lists some of those challenges. And like, oh my goodness, how did he get up every day? How did he keep going? How did he, how did he not just abandon all hope? But here's what he says. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction, it was overwhelming stuff. He calls it light and momentary is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The Bible, the story of Jesus, the cross, the resurrection, it's the greatest story of hope ever has been, ever will be. And all of us need hope. Some of you right now, life is just heavy for you right now for any number of reasons. Uh, hope is in short supply. You need hope because bad news is the only news you know. You need hope because all seems lost. You, you need hope because you're just bored with life. You're at a spot where you're saying, you're looking around, is this all there is? And that comes in two different categories. Sometimes, is this all there is? Comes in response to frustration and life just not working out the way you pictured it working out. And sometimes, that is this all there is comes when you've experienced nothing but success. Everything is up and to the right. And you you climb that ladder and you got to the top and you discovered I may be leaning against the wrong wall with my ladder. And and you said, so this this is all there is? This is as far as the road goes? This is all I have to look forward to? You need hope. Some, because you just don't know for sure that if you die today, you'd go to heaven. This isn't all settled for you. And it can be settled. You can walk out of here with this settled for a lot of people, I hope it works out. The hope in Christ is a whole lot more than I hope it works out. It's assurance, it's settled, it's sure. We all need hope. And I want to read a passage to you. I'm going to back up beyond what is mentioned in your bulletin. We're going to look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 32. 
Next Sunday, we'll spend time, uh, something I haven't done in several years, and uh, really felt a conviction for next week to just spend some time talking about the cross. And uh, we'll talk uh, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper next Sunday. Verse 32 of Luke chapter 23 says, They've arrived now at the place of execution. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that's called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, praying over the very people who are carrying out his execution, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Another one of those uh, responses to prophecy. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Now, verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged uh, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, we're receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, You'll be with me in paradise. What hope does a man hanging on a cross have? He has no hope at all in the first century. He's going to die a slow and painful death over hours, over sometimes a few days. Yet this man found hope in the middle of the most hopeless of situations. The Bible is filled with the message of hope. The Bible says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. This story, we talk about hope in the Bible, this story of hope wrapped around the, the cross and the resurrection, all of our hopes are found in Christ who died on the cross to pay for our sin, was raised from the dead. And he gives us hope, not just for heaven one of these days, but he is our only hope for life right now. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. The message version of that says it this way. What a God we have. And how fortunate we are to have him. This Father of our Master Jesus because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for. Everything to live for. That's what hope looks like. Hope is the anchor that holds you steady when this life feels stormy. It's the thing that, 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 that brings you help and encouragement when you need help and you are so deeply discouraged. It's it's found in day-to-day -day life. It is realized in its completeness in a place called heaven. And the thief on the cross said, Jesus, remember me. Don't forget me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus promises that he would be with him in heaven. That assurance is the greatest of hope builders. Hope, assurance, promise from the Lord. And today, we just all need a little bit of hope. Now, I wanted to give you that kind of lead in. And I'll tell you a story. There was a pastor. Was, you've heard this story. Most of you have heard this story lots of times. Jesus died on the cross for our sin, raised from the dead. And it rolls off the tongue. Man, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And it sounds so quick, so trite, so simple. And yet how overwhelming and how powerful and how life transforming that story is. There was a pastor who was preaching to his church. And it was a small country congregation, not a lot of people in the building. He's preaching with all his heart. He had a sense of urgency about the gospel. And, and he said, Every one of you people in this congregation, you are all going to die. Well, that's a reality. He circled back and he repeated it with greater sense of urgency. Every one of you people in this congregation, you're all going to die. 
And he finished it the second time, and a guy in the back just busted out laughing. Uh, of all things to, to make light of, a, a statement like that, just laughing. And a small group, and everyone turned around and looked. And he said, it's a, just an older uh, little man in the back. He said, he, he didn't know him. He said, what is so funny about that statement? He said, I don't belong to this congregation. <laughs> well, I know it was a long way to go, but I was willing to take the trip. <laughs> death is a certainty for all of us. And some people say, I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid to die. I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. And I've had that conversation. I've, had, I've said people sit across from me. Multiple settings, multiple places, multiple countries. I'm not afraid to die. If I could see it in their eyes, there's more going on there than their faithless statement. Uh, I've been going through things that uh, I've saved that Billy Graham said or Billy Graham did. And just uh, continue to celebrate his life and his influence on so many. And, and me. Uh, through his books, through his speaking, through things he, he said. This, this story is... What, one of my favorite Billy Graham stories. It was early in his ministry, and he went to see a dying patient in the hospital. And as he's talking to him, always pressing forward, always getting the conversation turned toward the gospel, which is what we all should do in every conversation, always move things toward Jesus. He, he said to this man who was terminally ill, was close to the end of his life's journey, are you afraid to die? And this is what the man said to him. It's a, it's a great, great statement. He said, I'm, I'm not afraid to die, but I'm afraid of what comes after that. Terribly afraid. Terribly afraid. Today, I want to talk about what comes after that. And because Jesus introduced the idea of heaven to the thief on the cross, uh, I think that's an important thing for us to focus on. In a book called What is to Come, there's a quote, Talking about heaven, it said, Heaven is not a cash payment for walking with God. It's where the road goes for a Christ follower. It's just where the road goes. And the end of that road for a believer in Christ yields a perfect experience with a perfect and powerful, loving Savior. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about heaven, thinking about heaven, because I think the more heavenly minded we are, the more earthly good we will be. Now, I didn't give you an outline last Sunday. And uh, so I really feel uh, I'm indebted to you for that because I know how you live for it. So we have four whole things today for you to fill in blanks about. Here's the first one. We enter heaven, from this passage, we enter heaven by faith in Jesus the Christ. The thief on the cross is a fascinating character in the Bible. In, in Matthew's account of this, it says both of these guys hang on either side of Jesus they, they were both mocking Jesus, making fun of Jesus, ridiculing Jesus, right along with the worst of Jesus' enemies. But here's what happened. Something changed for this one guy. Uh, last week, we, we talked about Joseph of Arimathea, and he had seen a lot about how Jesus lived, and I think it really touched his life deeply. The thief on the cross, I don't know, uh, we don't know that he ever had any touch with Jesus when Jesus uh, was out teaching or performing miracles. He didn't seem to have anything of that. But he saw how Jesus died. And he learned a lot about Jesus from the way he died. And he saw Jesus had resources he did not have. Uh, things that he was so spiritually bankrupt. He was lost and helpless and hopeless. Jesus had something uh, well beyond that. And because of that, he spoke up to defend Jesus. Jesus with that confidence, Jesus with that security. In the face of, of death itself, and I think it's something he couldn't even imagine for himself. And through Jesus' testimony of how he died and the things he said from the cross, that thief made the best decision he'd ever made. And the reason he was dying on a cross was he made a lot of bad decisions. But at that point in his life, he made a great decision. He did what every one of us has to do. He acknowledged his sin. He told the other thief, we're getting exactly what we deserve. We're, we have earned execution on these crosses. But this man's done nothing. He recognized, I'm a sinner, 
and I deserve what I'm getting. I'm not, I'm not trying to compare myself to someone else. I'm not trying to present some kind of religious resume. I'm lost and helpless and hopeless. And he put all his faith in Jesus as the only one who could fix it. Not, not in anything he had done, but completely he surrendered his life to Jesus. Jesus is going to have all of me there is to have. I'm going to trust Jesus that, that in this hopeless situation, there's going to be hope in eternity. He knew he needed a Savior. And every one of us has to do that same thing. Recognize I'm lost, helpless, hopeless in this broken world. And I need, I need saving. Now note, God is so gracious in this story. And that's the part of it that stands out to me, I think, more than just about anything else in the story. That this guy, he never went to any church he never sang in any choir. He never taught any Sunday school classes. He never did any good deeds for anybody, uh, perhaps. Uh, never cared about anyone but himself. He never baptized, confirmed. Uh, and yet, he put his faith in Jesus, having confessed his sin. And he went to heaven that day. And he's in heaven to this day. Now, Every religious poll that shows up in these United States of America, we, you ask people, do you believe there's a place called heaven? And they say yes. Overwhelmingly, way up in the 90 percentile, yes, I believe that there's a heaven. And they may have some skewed ideas about what that heaven's going to be like compared to how the Bible describes it, but they have some view of the afterlife in heaven. If you ask those people, so you think you're going to end up there? Overwhelmingly, well in the 90th percentile, Americans say, yes, of course I'm going to be there. You ask them, okay, well tell me why. When you die, you're going to go to whatever your vision is of heaven. And again, way up in the percentages, they say the same thing. I'm a good person. I'm better than most people I know. I do some religious stuff. Sometimes I help people. I have this resume of good deeds and religious stuff. And I've been baptized. I'm a member of a church. They, they come up with that list of all these things that should qualify them. And I think I'm pretty good. And I'm, and I'm just hoping that my religious resume, my good guy resume is enough. And that when I die, I'll be 51% of the good. And I'll be okay for eternity. I hope. And that is not the same thing as biblical hope, which is assurance. God doesn't save us because we deserve it. He doesn't save us because of the good things we've done or the religious things we've done. He offers this gift of salvation because he's a God of great love. And our only step in the process is he offers this gift is just to accept it, to trust it. It's, this is the only way. Not, not what Jesus did plus what I do. Not how I've lived, what I bring to the table. We acknowledge our sin and we trust Jesus as our only way of being saved. And like the thief of the cross, we come just as we are. Now, people who think, and I'm talking to folks, there's certain things in the, <laughs> there's certain stories in the Bible, teachings in the Bible, that just rub you the wrong way. And yours will be different than mine. Things that go, well, that just kind of gets under my skin. I don't like how that reads. I don't like how that feels. I don't like what that teaches. The thief on the cross just causes some real troubles for some folks. Because he didn't do anything. And that bothers a lot of people. And they have a hard time with this Bible story. Because they say, well, he was guilty. He deserved his punishment. How could Jesus forgive a guy like that? Because he didn't do anything good. He didn't do anything religious. You know, neither did any of us. Neither did any of us. Nothing to merit forgiveness, salvation, heaven forever and ever. Jesus through our life in this life. Paul wrote, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. <laughs> Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not after we cleaned up our life. Not after we did a lot of religious stuff. Not after we created that good guy resume. He did it while we were still lost and broke just like the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross... Just says, hey, how, how big is God's grace? How far does his love go? It goes all the way to that guy who had nothing to offer except a repentant spirit. 
and a faith in Jesus. Second thing, we learn from this passage, we enter heaven the moment we die. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus did not say, one of these days you'll be with me in paradise. Eventually you'll be with me in paradise. Once, once we've done a little cleaning up on the in-between here and there, you'll be with me in paradise. I've heard people in conversation talk about death. They, they have fears about the transition from this life to the next life. Like, okay, what, what, happens, in, what happens in there? What's that going to be like? And I'm kind of an unsure, unsettled footing on that particular issue. And so you end up with, uh, okay, I've heard stories, end of life experiences. Uh, you know, came to the end of my life. And, or the person who, oh, they died on the table for a while. They, come, they bring them back, but they said, I saw a bright light, and I was walking toward the light. You know, I can't, I can't speak to anybody's story like that, but I can with authority Say what the authoritative word of God says. And here's what the authoritative word of God says. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Last breath here, next breath there. No in between. A moment here and, a, and instantly there. No transition in between. You're just there with the Lord in his glory. And that's how it works in the Bible. So for me, I'm just going to stick with what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Like Popeye. There was a, uh, by the way, I, thanks for letting me do the children's sermon week to week. It's one of my favorite things I get to do. It has been for all these years of being here. Uh, and I love our multi generational approach to, to ministry. Churches do it different ways and different places, and there are different churches for different people. I love our multi generational approach to things where we're all in this together. And, uh, I know that sometimes for parents, it can be a pretty good stretch, kids, especially as kids are getting used to being in a big church. And thanks for persevering in that. And they're picking up a lot more. And a lot of you have great testimonies of that a lot more than you realize, a lot more than it appears they're picking up on. I heard this story from a pastor. He, he had uh, had a kid in his church. Child went home after Sunday services, had lunch. And he came rushing in to see his mother the kitchen. She was cleaning up. He said, Mom, Mom, there's a man under my bed. Well, she's had her doubts about that. There's not a man under you. No, there's a man under my bed. There's a man under my bed. So, you know, to, to calm his fears, I'm going to go and I'm going to see what's going on. It's wooden, wood floor, wooden floors, and she dropped down on all fours and pulled up the comforter, looked under. And there's dust gathered up under there, reminded her, well, I always forget about that. I need to get back and clean up under there. And she said, he said, see, there's a man under my bed. Because the pastor this morning said, from dust you came to dust you shall return. And there's a man under my bed either coming or going. Well, we don't have to worry about, here's, here's why, sometimes it's just for me, but some, somewhat for you. We don't have to worry about the coming and going part. When we leave this life, we go straight to heaven. Here's the third thing. We enter heaven to experience paradise. So heaven is this place of wonder that the biblical writers, they record their visions of heaven as God pulls back that curtain occasionally. and They try to describe heaven, the indescribable. So how do you do that with the limitations of human language? That's overwhelming. How incredible is the glory of heaven? Well, think about it this way. Now, many of you have been to the Grand Canyon or maybe you've been to like a place like Niagara Falls and you see that and if you don't show a picture of it, you're just confined to telling about it. How do you explain that to somebody? So oh, it's, it's grand, it's overwhelming, it's, it's beautiful, powerful. Uh, the colors, the light and the... The, okay, well, so Niagara Falls, so tell me, give me, give me a description of what's going on there at Niagara Falls. I've never seen it. Uh, tell me, tell me what's, well, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of water, and it comes off the face of this cliff, and it falls below. Oh, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a bus ticket to see that. That sounds really exciting. You're just so limited by language. Tell me about 
the Grand Canyon? Well, it's, it's like a big ditch with a water running in the bottom of it, and it's, but it's really big, and no, oh, never mind. You, never, you don't want to go to Arizona anyway. How do you describe the indescribable? Well, that's what these guys are trying to do with heaven, I'm trying to describe some, the glory of heaven, the power of the throne room of heaven, and lightning flashes and thunder and all this stuff going on. How do you describe it? Heaven. Well, Jesus did a great job describing heaven. My favorite images of heaven as Jesus lays hold of a special word. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that, he's talking about heaven, but it's a unique kind of word. Because the word paradise is from a Persian root word that refers to a beautiful park. So here's what happens. See, the Old Testament is uh, the original books of the Old Testament written in Hebrew. Well, when the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into a Greek version, the Septuagint, when they talked about the Garden of Eden, they translated that into Greek. They used the word paradise. So Jesus lays hold of that little image. And he says, heaven is paradise. It's like the Garden of Eden. It's this perfect place. It's this beautiful place. It's a place of unhindered, uninterrupted fellowship with God. It's a place where uh, before, before the fall, there's, there's no sin to stir things up and to mess stuff up. That's today you will be with me in that place, in paradise. And it's such a, a beautiful image. We enter heaven to experience paradise. And the fourth thing, we enter heaven to be with Christ. As the Bible talks about heaven, it tells about some of the things that aren't there. And I celebrate that part. It talks about there's no sin, no sorrow, no pain, no death. A lot of things that make life, no sickness. A lot of things that make life so difficult here, absent in heaven. Heaven is a wonderful thing because the bad things that aren't there. Heaven is a wonderful thing because the great things that are there. You think about heaven, what do you think about? Streets of gold, gates of pearl. People I know who have Jesus in their life, who've died, who are going to be in heaven. Heaven's a place of reunion. Heaven's a place of worship and celebration. But what makes heaven, heaven? This is an interesting thing, and I've mentioned it at some point along the way, I'm sure. When, uh, when I talk to adults and I say, when you think about heaven, what do you think about they say, streets of gold, gates of pearl. My grandmother, people I know, they'll, they'll tell a lot of stuff. It's when I talk to grade schoolers, most of the time when I say, when you think about heaven, what do you think about? You know what they, go, they do? Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. They peel back all the, all the periphery and get right to the heart of it. I'll be with Jesus. And, you know, I, I talked to him about, it, you know, yeah, we can pray and, you know, Jesus is always right here with us. But to be in heaven is like we're sitting in this room together. That's what it's going to be like to be with Jesus in heaven. That's what makes heaven, heaven. It says a lot about where you are in your spiritual walk. Say, what are you most excited about in heaven? That I will be with Jesus. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So what does hope look like? Well, for this guy, you know, Friday morning, he was lost, condemned to die, a thief on a cross. Sometime, I guess uh, Friday afternoon, he is forgiven, transformed, and bound for heaven. That's what Jesus does. That's the hope that he brings to the most hopeless of situations. I've had this conversation here and in other places in the world where I've shared the gospel. People say, I believe that story is true. Jesus did that on the cross for me. He was raised from the dead. I believe all that, but I'm not ready to surrender my life. We're, we're talking to people in our community and overwhelmingly, this is the response we get. I believe that people who are going to be in church somewhere today in our community, I believe all that cross-resurrection stuff. 
but I'm not ready to surrender my life to Jesus. That's where we get the hitch in the plan. I'm not ready to surrender my life to Jesus because I just have some things I want to do between now and the end of my life. I have some things I'm looking forward to. See, I can, I can always put that off. I can do that next week or next year or on my deathbed, just like this thief on the cross. I can do it at the very, just before I die. And then I got forgiven and I, didn't have to, and I got to do whatever I wanted to and drive my own life right up to the end. Be like the thief on the cross. But the question is always, which thief on which cross? Because one of those guys was forgiven and spent eternity in heaven, was with Jesus. And the other one went into eternity separated from God forever in hell. Which thief on which cross? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And when you have the opportunity to say yes to Jesus, that's the time to say yes to Jesus. I guess, uh, let's see, we're two Sundays ago. I was, I was sitting in a mud hut with a grass roof and a dirt floor with a third world family. And I shared the story of Jesus. Jesus who died on the cross and was raised from the dead. And I ask, is there anything that would keep you today from saying yes to Jesus? Jesus who loves you so much, he's reaching out to you in love and grace. He invites you to reach back, turning from sin, repentance, and faith, surrender. Is there anything that would keep you from that? Not, I can do that another day. I can do that next week. Today is the day of salvation. Why would you put that off? And a whole household, people who are lost, accepted Christ. Yes, we want to give our life to Jesus. Uh, household. And I led them in a commitment prayer. And some of you who've uh, been a part of things in uh, the African outreach things we've done, Sometimes when you lead a commitment prayer, uh, everybody prays. And I had five church members with me in that little uh, mud hut. And they all prayed along with me as I prayed. Uh, this is the kind of thing you need to express to God in a commitment prayer. And so I'm going to ask you to do that today. Some of you have already made this commitment. Some of you maybe not yet. Some of you just not sure. But I want us to do this together. There are different ways to voice this to God. But I'm going to ask you. It's an encouragement to believers. The gospel is always an encouragement to believers. It's a challenge to those who are not believers yet. It's a, it's a step of becoming a new creation. Someone who, who for the first time in their life says yes to Jesus. So I'm going to pray this out loud. Just a few words at a time. And I'm going to ask all of us to say it together. As a expression of commitment, maybe recommitment for some to the Savior. Let's bow our heads. And maybe this, for those of you who've never given your life to Christ, this would give you some words to use as we express it to the Lord. And so, repeat, uh, if you would, together. Father God, thank you that you love me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I want to turn from sin. Today, I turn my life to Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe he paid for my sin. I believe Jesus was raised from the dead. I believe he's the son of God. Today, I surrender my life to Jesus. Jesus, be the king in my life. I will follow you with all my heart 
for the rest of my life. Thank you for this gift of salvation. Thank you for the hope of eternal life in heaven. Father God, today, erase my name from the book of death. Write my name in your book of life recorded in heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior and my Lord, amen.